Um, welcome to Dr. John Parkinson's lecture, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to fulfill by the end of this that all of you will have a smile on your faces. Dr. Parkinson received his undergraduate degree in psychology from Durham in 1990 and his postgraduate degree at Cambridge in 1994. He came to Bangor in 2004 for, and I'm using his quotes, academic excellence, fabulous mountains, and an almost tropical sea, and is happy to say that he's found all three in buckets full. He's currently a lecturer, psychologist, and counselor in the University School of Psychology. His research focuses on understanding how emotions, as well as motivation, interact with cognition, which is the mental process of gaining knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. In tonight's talk, Dr. Parkinson will talk about how positive affective states, also known as happiness, um, and how these positive states influence different cognitive processes, and how our cognitions, thoughts, and attitudes can influence the way we experience moods and positive states. Thank you, Donna, and what a lot of lovely, smiley, friendly faces out there tonight. So what I'm going to do, as Donna mentioned, is, is talk about positive psychology and talk about happiness. Um, part of my sort of research domain is to, is to study positive states and the way that positive states affect us. And what I want to try and do tonight, really, is not so much focus in one or two areas in depth, but more of a broad brush approach and look across the realm of positive psychology. Uh, it's a relatively new field, maybe 10 or 20 years. And there are some interesting, if not fascinating, findings which are coming out about the way not only in which uh, positive moods can influence our thoughts and cognitions, but also the way in which our thoughts and cognitions, our attitudes, uh, can influence the way in which we experience happiness or positive states. Two of the major tenets of positive psychology, I would think really at the core, are firstly that, that happiness, positivity, is something that we can seek, something that we can be, be active in seeking. And for some of you that might seem obvious, well, you know, of course I can go out looking for happiness. Um, but for others, I think for a lot of people, there's more a sense of, you know, I'm sitting at home, I'm sitting in my office, you know, something good might happen tomorrow, you know, I might win the lottery next week. More of a sort of a passive approach hoping that something will happen to them. And in many ways, what positive psychology research has demonstrated is that we can be more active in going out and trying to improve our quality of life, improve our experiences, uh, optimize them. And so what I'm going to do uh, for part of today, this evening, is talk about the, the processes that, are, that can, can help do that. And I guess the second tenet which follows from that is that um, again, sometimes we assume that we're either a happy person or a, or a sad person, we're an optimist or a pessimist, and that it's in some way dispositional, that we come into the world with that. Um, but that seems also not to be entirely true. I mean, we clearly have some sort of predisposition. There is an inherited component to positivity and happiness. Um, but there's a lot of room for manoeuvre. So we can also, be, in a way, be trained, be taught how to be more positive and be happier. So, in that sense, the sort of the foundation of positive psychology uh, is a very positive one. And it's that we can find happiness and we can be taught how to do it if we don't really know. And what I re as I mentioned, this sort of broad brush approach, I'm just going to have a look at a few demonstrations or examples um, of what, what benefit this has to us. And I guess I should apologise to some of you who may well have been to either my first year lectures on positivity or my recent well-being talk. Um, I have used some slides, so there is a little bit of overlap here. Anyway, to begin. A gun being pointed at a kitten. It has nothing to do with my talk, but I like it. More seriously. Um, this was in the paper last week. And uh, it talks about um, a think tank, the uh, New Economic Foundation, which was looking at well-being across Western Europe, interested in how happy people are in the different countries. And um, you'd be pleased to know that people in Britain are seen as tired, suspicious, bored, and lonely. Not only that, we came third from bottom in the entirety of Western Europe in terms of our well-being and our positivity. Um, I think possibly most interestingly is that we're the most bored country in Western Europe. 
uh, with 8% of us feeling bored most of the time. <laughs> Just fantastic. What an indictment. And it's believed to be because uh, we've been squeezed out of opportunities for individuals, families and communities to pursue activities that promote well-being. So we haven't had the opportunities, we don't have the chance. I mean, obviously this is quite interesting and what it demonstrates is a, a kind of shift in focus, even at the, at the national sort of governmental level, to considering that um, happiness or well-being, whatever that might be, is actually an important uh, factor or, or characteristic to take into consideration when, when deciding policy. What it also, I think, draws out, what I want to use it for, is the fact that um, there are lots of different terms here. There's well-being, there's, there's being tired, suspicious, bored, and lonely. I mean, you know, is happiness the absence of being tired, suspicious, bored, and lonely? Um, so what I want to start with is really just to, to cover some brief sort of definition ground um, in terms of what is happiness, what do psychologists think happiness is? And I know that, you know, if, if I said all of you now write down or think about a definition of what happiness is for you, then there would be overlap, but I think you'd also have slightly different definitions, or some of you might capture one aspect of it and some of you might capture another. So just to, so we kind of all know what we're talking about, these are the sorts of things that psychologists have considered to be, to be what is happiness. Um, in the first instance, there's, uh, this says pleasure. This kind of pleasures, momentary rewards kind of engagement. So this is sort of, you know, you have your cup of coffee when you get into work, or you have your cigarette outside behind the bike sheds, um, or you have your pint of beer in the evening. Something that gives you some sort of kick, some sort of slight high. Oh, that was nice. Um, you know, a friend gives you a gift. Somebody comes in and tells you a joke. All of those little things that, in the moment, give you some sort of positive sort of feeling. And it can either be um, something that kind of somebody does to you, somebody gives you a gift, etc., etc., or it could be something that you've actively gone out and done. So you're engaging, you've gone for a run, or you're playing sport, and you you know you win or something like that. And so throughout the day, throughout the week, we can have lots of momentary rewards, lots of pleasures, and these kind of you know sum up. And in a way, we can consider them as being uh, affective. So it's about feeling. It's what we're feeling. The reason we like it, the reason we enjoy the coffee, the cigarette is because it gives us a good feeling. Separate from that, perhaps somewhat independent, is a more thoughtful, reflective process. Kind of, you know, how am I feeling? How is my life going? Are the things that I'm doing consistent with my life's goals? Um, and so we might term this gratification or, or well-being. So it's a kind of a slightly more overarching concept. And it's more about our reflections. So is the stuff we're doing on a daily basis consistent with our, our longer-term longer, longer -term aims? And so here, this is more of a concept of happiness over time. Now, of course, if, we, if things are going in the way we, we anticipate, our career is going in the right direction, our, our, our marriage is going in the right direction, our friends are going in the right direction, then, of course, it's likely that these two are going to correlate. So you've got good feelings of well-being, reflections of well-being, and also you're enjoying your daily pleasures. Well, they don't need to, and in fact, studies have demonstrated that these are relatively independent constructs. So, for example, someone who um, hates their job, hates their marriage, um, they might still drink a lot and smoke a lot and you know, do stuff to try and give them those kicks, but there's no consistency between the two. So they do seem to be somewhat independent. A third sort of domain, I'm not really going to talk about this tonight, is what we might call serenity. Um, it's the sort of thing that, say, Buddhism pursues, this idea of being um, at inner peace, at one with the, with the universe. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to focus more on sort of the gratification, the well-being component, and the sort of momentary pleasure component. We can also consider uh, positive states in general from different perspectives. So I've talked about happiness, well-being, gratification. We can also think about them in terms of uh, time. Uh, so we can reminisce about the past, uh, we can be nostalgic, we can be content about how life has gone. We can enjoy the moment, so that's the kind of the, the momentary pleasures. Uh, and we can look to the future, we can be optimistic. This one's fantastic. <laughs> we can look to the future and be optimistic about the future. The important aspect, I guess, that I want to try and capture, and we'll come back to it, is that no matter whether you're reminiscing about the past, or thinking to the future, being hopeful or pessimistic. You experience it in the here and now. So your lives are now, in the moment. 
If you look to the future and worry about all the things that you want to avoid, then again it will impact on how you feel now. And so a lot of what psychologists have demonstrated in terms of happiness is that it's not so much necessarily what you're doing in the moment, but it's the way that you have biases or attitudes towards your past and your future. So if you focus on positive events in the past, then it's likely you'd be a more positive person in the moments when you're interacting on a daily basis. And likewise, a sort of a more optimistic, positive outlook to pursue goals and to, to be positive about the, the achievement of those goals will lead to a more positive now, as it were. So life is very much in the present. These other two things, they're just a figment of your imagination. And of course, there are these different components. So there's this cognitive element we can reflect on, on the past, on the future, on where things are going. And we can, we can feel, to various extents, um, the, the affective component and the, the bodily component. My heart's pounding, for example. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the idea of whether we can, um, we can learn to be happy or, or lose that happiness. Um, there have been a few studies that have looked at the heritability of, of happiness. So, for example, um, this study by Licken looked at 4,000 pairs of twins and looked at the way in which, you know, compared the way in which the, the twins shared sort of happiness or were different. And they argue that about 50% of happiness is inherited. So you kind of come into the world with a predisposition to either be a bit more optimistic or not so. Um, but of course, that leaves plenty of room uh, for learning and experiences um, and other factors which might influence it. And so some people have argued, I mean, this is a kind of a controversial area. There are those that have argued, well, because of this predisposition, we can almost draw an analogy with, say, weight. So we all come into the world and we have a predisposition to be uh, of a particular weight. And we can go on a diet or we can eat more, but generally we kind of settle back to this set point. And people have made that argument for happiness too. So, you know, I'm perhaps a happy person and if lots of bad things happen to me, well, you know, I'll still get back and be happy again. If I'm a depressed person, again, I have this set point. And there's some evidence to support that. So well, if you look at, for example, people that win the lottery, so the people that win the big money on the lottery, of course they're euphoric and their mood is lifted and it's fantastic and my life has changed. But if you then test them a year or two later, you find that they're no happier than a control group that didn't win the lottery. So winning an enormous amount of money is fantastic for the moment, but generally these people go back to how they were. It doesn't seem to change lives in that sense. The converse is also true for, for example, people that become paralysed or lose limbs in accidents or injuries or whatever. And it, again, it's crushing and there's anger and frustration and pain at the time. But again, if you go back a year or two later, then you find that these people are generally as happy as they were before. You know, things have changed, but that happiness is still there. So there is an argument, and it's one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, to, to kind of positive psychology that we have this set point, you know, you can't really change me. But there is evidence to suggest that we can, and I'm going to present some of that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, when we experience things in life, uh, this is a list of life events, uh, negative events, some, some of them positive, but they, they can cause trauma. And generally, if you have lots of these in a short space of time, um, it precipitates things like depression and anxiety. So it's they're good, they're diagnostic in, in, um, in illness. But of course, not everyone gets ill. And so there are these individual differences. And there seem to be things like attitude differences between individuals. And some people are more resilient, other people less so. Um, hardy, for example. But these life events do seem to change us. So people that have a lot of negative life events might originally say, oh, I used to think life was fantastic, but now... To be honest, it's rubbish. So we do change. And what positive psychology, of course, tries to do is the opposite, is to, is to say, well, you know, okay, so some of life is rubbish, but th there's other, other bits that are good, so let's see how we can develop or change. Anyway, that's kind of by way of a very relatively brief introduction to the sorts of issues that are, that are cropping up in positive psychology. What I want to focus on now is in a way, it's an obvious question, but I think there's some fairly intriguing findings. Um, 
What are the effects of being happy? What's the point? You might be sitting there thinking, OK, John, you can spout at me for an hour about being happy, but why should I? What's the value of being in a good mood? And of course, you know, we can be more relaxed, we smile more, we become a bit more pro-social. You know, I'm more likely to lend you a tenor if I'm in a good mood. So there are benefits. Uh, intuitive ones, but there are other benefits which are less intuitive, which I think are, are brilliant, and we'll just go through a few of these. So, for example, in some of the early work, um, imagine you go to the phone box in the days when there were phone boxes, and you go in and you go to dial a thing, and of course you stick your fingers in the little thing to see if there's any spare change. You know you did it. And, and of course you do, you find some. So, part, so one group in this study found change in a payphone. And this they called the positive mood induction. It was kind of a momentary pleasure. So it's something unexpected, and it was good. So you find a bit of money, it's unexpected, it brightens your day a little bit, puts you in a positive mood. Um, so there's one group that found the, the money and another group that didn't, the control group. And shortly afterwards, um, these participants, they met a stooge. So they met an experimenter who was pretending. And uh, he was kind of walking across the road, like, you know, and, oh, I've dropped my papers. And the question was, would the person who'd found money be more likely to help or not? You know, so is, is being in a good mood, is being happy, kind of does it make you more altruistic? Um, and of course it does. They found that the people that found the coins were significantly more likely to help out. And so in a way, something even very small, like finding a couple of quid in a payphone, can actually put you in a much more altruistic mood. It makes you more likely to help other people. It's quite a powerful effect for such a small manipulation. Possibly slightly more scary. Um, now let's take some doctors and you give them a bag of chocolates. Now they're not allowed to eat them because we don't want to have an effect of some sort of glucose change in the blood. But it, this again, it's a positive mood induction. It's supposed to make them slightly happier, unexpected gift. So next time you go to the GPs, give them a bag of chocolates. Um, and they were given some hypothetical uh, cases to diagnose, make di diagnoses of. And what they found was that those doctors that were given treats um, exhibited better decision-making and diagnostic skills. They weren't necessarily quicker or slower, but they seemed to be better at drawing the evidence together and making an accurate diagnosis. Again, based simply on giving an unexpected gift. So from this, we might suggest that this somehow, and I mean, there are some mysteries here. We don't really know why some of these effects exist. Um, but this positive emotion seems to produce some form of superior reasoning. I'll come back to that. Does anybody want to help me pick these up? <laughs> Another way of inducing positive mood, um, watching a funny film. So, you know, the, the, the invention of YouTube, how to induce positive mood. Watch a funny film and then get people to be creative. Uh, one way to, to test creativity, it's a fairly simple way, is you could say something like, uh, imagine that you're going to have a week off next month, week off in March, uh, where would you go on holiday? I want you to be realistic, but just write down a few ideas. What would you like to do? And what you find is that the mood you are in has a really quite a powerful impact on the number of ideas you come up with, the kind of number of realistic ideas you come up with. And so if you do this kind of thing, what you find is that people in a negative mood state generally produce a fewer number of ideas than those in a positive mood state. And so there seems to be some kind of continuum here between um, a reduction in creativity in negative mood and an increase in creativity um, in a positive mood state. So again, if, you, if you've got some horrible dilemma that you need to solve, um, then go and watch a funny film and then sit down and think about it there. Don't get stressed thinking about it. Okay, what about health? Well, take a group of participants, assess their sort of emotional state, whether they're positive, negative, um, and then inject them with, with cold, common cold. Nice study. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. <laughs> and then come back later and see if they succumb to the cold. And what you find is that people that report being in, in more of a positive, general positive mood, um, show reduced symptoms and a, and a reduced likelihood of catching the cold. So it's somehow being in a positive mood, or certainly be it not being in a negative mood, seems to, to boost the immune system or to give the immune system a greater a benefit. 
So in some way, positive emotion appears to promote a healthy immune system. Now, of course, I mean, this sounds kind of a bit freaky, but we, we, you know, we believe, we completely take in the idea that when we're stressed and anxious and negative, then it does suppress our immune system. So clearly, there's, kind of, there's a lot of evidence to support the negative side of it, that when things are going badly, we seem to have a reduced immune response. Um, and this really just shows the converse, that you know, if we are positive, then we can actually show a, a supported or boosted immune response. So those are a number of sort of manipulated studies. So this is where you take people and you do something to them. In this case, you know, either make them happy or try and make them ill. Um, but what you find is that positive mood, happiness, induced in some minor way, can actually have quite a profound impact. When you look at sort of correlational studies, so you're just looking at relationships, you also find some stuff which seems to support this whole idea that positive mood is very beneficial. Um, when you look at people's work lives um, and, the, and the way that they report positivity, what you find is that people who say they're happy in their work tend to be also be the ones that show the greatest productivity. You also find that people who report greater happiness are also, they get better evaluations and they seem to be getting be better pay. Oliver. And, then, and this is the final one I'm going to talk about, the Nun study, which some of you may come across. This sort of did hit quite a few headlines. When a cohort of uh, nuns went into the convent, they kept diaries. And these experimenters went back in time through the diaries and looked at the use of positive or negative terminology, state, that kind of thing. So, you know, Nun A might be saying, oh, I had a wonderful day, really enjoying the convent. Um, and Nun B might be saying, oh, God, this is awful, horrible, I don't like anyone. And so you can look at the, the way that people use positive and negative language. And what these people found was that the, the nuns that reported greater happiness also lived much longer, significantly longer. And the reason that this is quite a powerful study is that uh, nuns in a convent actually have a very carefully controlled environment. So in a way, all of these people, these participants, um, had a very similar lifestyle. They ate the same kind of stuff. They had the same kind of exercise. They had the same kind of daily routine. So a lot of factors were controlled. And yet one of the, one of the factors that differed, their levels of reported happiness, seemed to have some relationship with their longevity. Okay. So positive mood, happiness, seems to be good for us. Evidence supports the idea that it has benefits, wide-ranging benefits, health, um, cognitive processing, uh, mood. But why might that be? And in fact, we know a lot about uh, negative emotions and what negative emotions do to us. So maybe if we compare and contrast negative and positive, we'll get some insight. If you don't like spiders, look away now. <gasps> So, here's a stimulus which is supposed to induce some kind of threat or fear. And you might sit there and say, OK, John, it's just a spider on a screen. So let it go! <laughs> it's all right, it's gone now. So what do negative emotions do? What do negative emotions do? What they do is they focus our attention on the source of threat. And they focus our behavioural repertoire. So what I mean by that is, I mean, rather than kind of sitting there thinking, oh, there's a spider on the screen, I wonder what I could do. You kind of think, spider! Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> That's it. That's your repertoire. <laughs> and it makes you think in a context of win-lose thinking. So and basically that means I'm going to win and the spider's going to lose. <laughs> it's self-protective. It's inward-looking. It's focusing on the individual and your own safety. It's very, I mean, it's very adaptive. It's very powerful. Um, so can we kind of understand positive emotions from this sort of perspective? So first of all, Nice puppy. Ah. Phew. You can feel it draining away, can't you? And there are various theories in positive psychology, uh, one of which is the broaden and build theory. And this argues really that um, positive emotions do the opposite to what negative emotions do. Um, so when you're in a good mood, rather than focusing your thought action repertoires, you widen them. You become more expansive, more of a problem solver. So when you're, in your, when you're on the savannah in evolutionary history and you've, you've 
killed all your predators and you've, you've gone out and hunted and you've got your prey, um, you, what you need to do is sit around the campfire and solve all the problems that are going on in, the, in your little social group. You know. So in a sense, it's about um, affiliation. It increases affiliative social behavior. Uh, it produces a more of a win-win interaction. So remember the altruism, things like that. Um, so the idea of rather than I've got to win, you've got to lose more, well, we can all win. Let's do something that will benefit it at all. <coughs> and gender is more of an outward-looking attitude, optimism, creativity. And so you can, if you kind of think back to those um, demonstrations, those experiments that I, that I mentioned, um, a lot of them fit into this broad idea that, you know, we can either be focusing on threats and kicking in our kind of adrenaline systems or whatever, or we can be, be, be kind of sitting back and being more broad-minded and, and more affiliative, doing stuff we can do when the threats have gone away. Now, as I mentioned, we know a great deal about the sort of the neuroscience of negative emotions. We know that when we see the threat, when we see the spider, um, we've got a system in our brain and our body, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA system, which some of you may have heard of, um, which is uh, supposed to be the fight or flight response. So there's a threat in the environment, um, your hypothalamus recognizes that, um, and through interactions with your pituitary, it releases adrenaline into the bloodstream and you kind of get active and you're ready to go. We know the brain mechanisms involved. Do we know much about positive emotions, the way that the effects, what's um, um, engendering these effects that I've demonstrated earlier? Um, and the answer is we don't know a great deal, but we do know a little bit. Um, and there's a, there's a peptide hormone called oxytocin, uh, which acts in both the brain and the body. It's best known and longest known um, for its effects in labor and breastfeeding. So uh, certainly in the US and possibly here, um, oxytocin is actually injected during labor to help induce um, and it helps to let down milk during breastfeeding. So it has this kind of very physiological nurturing role. But it does lots of other things too, as it turns out. Um, it's released at orgasm in both males and females. Uh, it's induced by some foods, potentially chocolate apparently, and also by massage. Um, most of the research has actually been carried out in voles. And th the reason is that there are, there are several types of vole. Um, and one group of voles are monogamous. They form lifelong monogamous pair bonds. And the other voles don't. They kind of split up and they're promiscuous. And what you find is that the monogamous voles have lots of oxytocin and the promiscuous ones don't. And you can manipulate it. So if you, if you antagonize the oxytocin in the monogamous voles, then they become promiscuous. And the same is true in sheep. So you can take um, a virgin mother. Does that make sense? Virgin sheep. And... Um, <laughs> And if you give them oxytocin, they'll show nurturing behavior, motherly-like behavior towards um, a, a lamb. And if you, again, if you antagonize a mother sheep, um, they will stop nurturing their infant. So oxytocin seems to play a, a, not only a kind of a physiological, but much more widespread role in kind of uh, nurturing, uh, pair bonding be in, um, behaviors and reactions. It also, as it turns out, um, as, a, as a chemical in the brain, antagonizes this HPA system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. So it, it actually has a direct effect. There are receptors in both the hypothalamus, amygdala, elsewhere. And so it seems to induce positive kind of affiliative nurturing behaviors and at the same time suppress this sort of fight or flight response, this negative response. So it may be the case that um, there's this sort of, um, and I guess, antagonistic relationship between looking for a threat in the environment and negative mood states, which help you do that, um, and being in a positive mood state and being more affiliative and nurturing. Now, you can actually manipulate oxytocin in humans, so you can, um, you can get nasal sprays, which uh, you snort. And there have been a few studies looking at the effect of oxytocin treatment in humans. Um, very briefly, what it seems to do, if you snort oxytocin, uh, it reduces your fear. So it seems to do what you might predict it do. It suppresses your self-reported sense of fear. Also, in a couple of studies, uh, it seems to increase trust and empathy. So there, it's been studied in a couple of computer games where you have to trust money to another player. And if you've, um, if you've taken oxytocin, then you seem to trust more money to another player. But it doesn't seem to be just risk-taking, because in this particular situation, 
if you say, if the, if the participant's told that it's the computer they're interacting with, then they don't show any more trust-like behavior. They don't risk any more money. But if they're told that it's another human that they're playing with, then they do show more money sharing. So it seems to induce a kind of a, a pro-social trust, but it has to be with another person. Um, in another computer game, you get this increased empathy. So um, the ultimatum game, which I won't go into, generally you have to take the perspective of the other player, try and uh, understand what they're going to do. So it's very much driven by empathy. And again, oxytocin increases generosity in this ultimatum game. So this peptide seems to be quite a key uh, neurochemical in supporting some of the effects of happiness or positive mood. So you might imagine that um, positive mood is induced in some way. So somebody, you see someone you haven't seen for a long time, or um, you have some positive social interaction. And what oxytocin does is then released, and it produces some of these pro-social affiliative, um, perhaps suppressing the negative effects that, that, we, we, that we can see. I mean, obviously, much more research needs to be carried out. Uh, amazingly, you can actually buy oxytocin yourself, if you want to. Um, so if you wonder why our, um, our open days are always so popular, and why our School of Psychology is such a um, popular university school in psychology, um, you might know. Check the air conditioning ducts. <laughs> OK, so I've talked a bit about positive mood, and I've talked about how it can sort of affect you. So that's you being passive. You're sitting around, somebody gives you a gift. Um, but how about going out to get it? So I did say at the beginning about how we're more active. We can go and seek positivity. So let's look a bit more positive mood. Um, there are two really important aspects when we look at mood. And one of them is uh, kind of arousal, physical, physiological arousal, kind of psychological arousal. And the other one is uh, control. And what I mean by that is a sense of being able to control the situation that you're in. I'll explain these. So let's do arousal first. Um, so we might consider arousal to be something like this continuum where we can be comatose, sleepy, awake, interested, focused, excited, really wired. Um, we might consider various things that produce this kind of arousal. So skydiving might make us sort of wired, and I guess even looking at this image, some of you might think, wow, fantastic. And others of you might think, mm. And then the scrambling, so kind of mountainy, rocky, climby stuff, um, and that's giving talks, um, producing some form of arousal and uh, reading books. Um, <laughs> lovely. Um, I'm watching TV, I'm being combed and sleeping. So, the, so we can consider this kind of continuum of arousal. But what determines how we interpret this? So I've talked about these, and some of them you might have thought, yeah, I'd like to do that. And some of them you might have thought, oh, I don't, really don't want to be in that position. So we can consider this sort of valence in a way. So skydiving can either be thrilling, really exciting, or it can be terrifying. In a way, it's the same arousal, it's the same physiological state, but it's interpreted differently. So one question I'll come back to is why might that be? How can one person be thrilled by skydiving and another person be terrified? Similarly, going over rocks on a mountainside, you could kind of enjoy it, you could be terrified. Giving a lecture, you know, here I am standing here, I have some level of physiological arousal, undoubtedly, and so I'm either terrified or engaging, or perhaps a combination of the two. And obviously doing things like reading a TV. You know, if you're watching a scary movie, you might enjoy it, or you might be a bit nervous about what's going to happen next. One of the important factors that seems to affect our interpretation of this is control, a perception of whether we can control the situation. So leaping out of a plane, we might be terrified if we've never done it before, but we might actually be really excited if we know, you know, I've got the cord shoot pole here and I've got the safety one here and, you know, I've, I've done it before, I'm ready to, I'm ready for it, bring it on. And so control seems to be a critical component in, in the way in which we interpret situations. The reason this is so important is that mood is about affect, it's about arousal, how we're feeling, but it's how we interpret it too. And it seems that when we feel like we can control a situation, uh, we, we're happy. We're more happy. And when we don't feel we're in control of the situation, then we're less happy. And indeed, you find that there are some people that crave control. 
in a sense they have to control the situation or else they're not happy. I'm sure we can all think of someone like that. So control seems to be an important factor and it seems to interact with arousal. That you get some state of, of arousal, if you feel you can control it, then you, it's good. But if you feel you're out of control, then it's bad. And there seems to be quite an important relationship between whether we think we can control our lives, our destiny, our situation, and the extent to which we actually then become happy about it. Now, I showed this life event scale a little earlier. Uh, most of these are uncontrollable. They're things that happen to you, and you can't do anything about them. And that's why they're so devastating, because it takes control from you. Now, importantly, and I think I, hopefully I got that across with the, the valence thing, um, it's impossible to judge the real controllability of an event. So if I go for a job interview, I can control some of it, but not all of it. And it's my best guess. It's my interpretation. So most of the time, we're just guessing. We're making a judgment. And what we find, and I'll come back to it briefly in a minute, is that it's, it's this kind of uh, bias, in a way, which determines whether we're optimists or pessimists. So some people seem to have a motivational bias or an attitudinal bias um, to believe they can control the world. And some people have a less of that. And what you find is the optimists think they control the world more than the, the pessimists can. It doesn't really matter whether it's true or not, it's a belief. So the more you believe that you can control your destiny, the more kind of optimistic, the more positive you will be. And this can be demonstrated um, experimentally and in fact, it was demonstrated many years ago by Martin Seligman, who's kind of the pioneer now of positive psychology. Um, this experiment's not particularly positive. Um, it's something called learned helplessness. Some of you may have come across it. Um, the way that it ran, initially, uh, you stick a dog in a box, and it's in this side of the box, and there's some bars on the floor, and you electrocute it. Not very nice. And there's nothing it can do. There's nothing it can do. It's helpless in that situation. But then, you open up this barrier so that, in theory, the dog could escape. And then you put it back in the box and you say, what is it going to do? Is it going to escape? So is it going to kind of leap through the thing and escape to victory? Um, or will it not? Will it stay there? And what you find is that the animals that have sort of been pre-trained, the animals that have been stuck in here and have been helpless, they've learned to be helpless, um, they don't escape. They kind of take their lot. They think, well, there's nothing I can do. It's life solvable. I got electrocuted in a box. And so, and so Martin Seligman described it as being learned helpless in the sense that through life's experiences, you can, you can actually learn that you can't control the world. It's just bad stuff happening to you. And so what he found was that control animals that had never been shocked jumped out pretty quickly. They, were, they, were, they learned it fast. But the ones that had, in a way, been learned to be helpless uh, didn't escape. And if we just very quickly shoot back, if my backwards button works. Again, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people who suffer from a lot of these life events often become depressed. And one of the explanations is that, you know, lots of stuff happens to you that's uncontrollable, and you give up hope in a way that you can control the world. So you become amotivational or depressed. OK. Um, so it's argued to be a kind of a model of depression. Uh, it's also been demonstrated with, with humans in studies with um, noise, uncontrollable noise. In a similar vein, um, you can also demonstrate that not only does it produce behavioural effects, but it also produces sort of psychological, um, physiological effects as well. So here's a, an experiment where uh, there's two rats in the box. Uh, one, can, one, which is called the master rat, uh, can press a lever. And what happens is they get electrocuted. Again, it's a fairly unpleasant experiment, I'm afraid. Um, they get electrocuted, but the master rat can turn it off. He has control. So it gets shocked, stop. This one, which is called yoked, has exactly the same experiences, but it has no control. So if this rat turns off the shock, then this one doesn't get it either. So their experiences are identical, other than this has control and this one doesn't have control. And what you find uh, again, these are old experiments done in sort of the 70s. Um, that if you're the yoked one, if you have no control, then you get ill. And this says total length of gastric lesion. It's basically a stomach ulcer. So you get a stomach ulcer if you can't control nasty things that happen to you. 
if you get a signal, actually no, hold on. If you are in control, it reduces the amount of the kind of physiological damage you suffer. You suffer. And this, if you get a signal telling you when the shock's coming, you get less of a deficit. Um, but the ones that are in control always come out best, as it were. And this um, also is demonstrated in the brain. And these are some plots of noradrenaline. So this is one of the kind of arousal chemicals. And what it shows is that depending on whether you get no shock or you can escape it or you can't escape it, uh, there's a big difference in the amount of adrenaline that you release. So again, control, perceptions of control, in this case, real control, um, really does have very potent effects both physiologically and in the brain. So again, I've talked a bit about control and about arousal and the way that they might interact to help us interpret situations, either be, in this case, kind of negative, uh, but in, in another case, whether we deal with situations positively. Um, and again, we know some of the neuroscience here. So if we look at intensity, the kind of the, the arousal component, um, we know that the amygdala, one of the well-known brain regions, um, it seems to react to, in to uh, intensity or arousal. And so here, this is again, um, uh, if you, if you foot shock an animal, then the amount of adrenaline re released in the amygdala, so this plot here with these spikes, is adrenaline being released, and it's time locked to the foot shock. So what you find is the amount of adrenaline that's released in your amygdala relates to uh, unpleasant things happening to you, or in, or in general sense, things happening to you that are arousing. And other studies have shown that the amount of adrenaline that is released is directly related to the strength of the intensity of, the, of what's happening to you. So it seems like signals in the amygdala code for the intensity of experiences. And this has been shown in humans too with positively valent stuff. Um, so here, uh, in a more recent study, uh, you smell something nice or something nasty. Uh, and here you get activity. This is the amygdala down here in the temporal lobes. And what you find is that people rate the smell. So, yeah, it was really nice. I mean, sorry, it was really strong smell, not very strong smell. And you can say it's really nice. It's not very nice. And what you find is there's a correlation, the red line, between the, the intensity of the experience. Oh, that was a really strong smell. And the amygdala activity. So the amygdala seems to be coding intensity, subjective intensity. You can also show it with, um, with sort of text descriptions of food. Um, I realize it's quarter past seven, you might not have eaten. Um, so just think about crispy duck, marinated in oriental spices, deep fried until golden and crispy, served with a hoisin sauce. <laughs> so depending on whether you like that description, your amygdala is now active. It's going for it. Um, and what you find here, again, is that if you ask people to rate, so if you look at that menu and say, oh yeah, that's fantastic, would you rate it on a one to five, then the higher you rate it, um, the greater the amygdala activity that you get. So the amygdala seems to be coding for the sort of the, the um, intensity of a, of, a, of a stimulus or an experience. Um, and there's another bit of the brain which seems to be coding for your control, your knowledge of the contingency. So it's an area of the brain which is of interest to, to clinical neuroscientists, uh, clinicians. It seems, to be it seems to be very much involved in depression. And you remember I mentioned that learned helplessness, a loss of control, seems to be to do with depression, is a model of depression. Um, and so what you find is that not, so you get reduced volumes in depressed individuals. And also the brain activity of depressed individuals uh, differs in this region from the brain activity of healthy individuals. So this seems to be involved in depression. It's also involved in control. So if you give people um, a task where, it's a very simple task, you, you just literally press a lever and you get money. It's great, lever, money. Lever, money. But not always. So there's a change in the contingency. So sometimes you press it and you always get money, and sometimes you press it and you never get money. And what you have to judge is, uh, the you have to make the judgment of the contingency. How much do I control the money coming to me? How much do I control the receipt of money? So it's your judgment of causality. Um, and what you find is people, when they make that judgment, they do it very accurately, and you get activity in a very similar area. So this, the area of the brain that seems to be involved in depression also appears in separate research to be quite, quite, quite critical for control, perceptions of control.
The medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala um, are highly reciprocally connected. They, re they really talk to each other. Um, and they've been known for a long time to sort of code different aspects of experiences. And so it may be that in this context, in the context of sort of positive psychology, um, the amygdala is coding for the, the intensity of an experience, how sort of positive and, well, how intense I'm feeling. And the prefrontal cortex is contributing to the way that I'm interpreting it. Is it a good experience or a bad experience? Interestingly, there's another domain of positive psychology which looks at the way in which people develop confidence, self-esteem. And what it argues is it's a term, it's an area called flow. And the idea is the more we engage in things which are challenging, so they cause us to be aroused, but we feel we can control them, um, the more enjoyment we get, the more self-esteem we get, the more self-confidence we get. So one arm of positive psychology really pushes this idea that in order to engender positivity, to just go out and seek positive moods, uh, we should do stuff that engages pr probably this system. So it makes us, it challenges us, gets us aroused, but we feel we can control it. And that's called flow. And we're just going one slide on this. I hope Janet doesn't mind that we show this quick video. This is flow. Yeah, yeah. So it's challenging, it's arousing. <laughs> but there's a sense of control. There's a sense of we're not going to die, at least on this occasion. And flow is characterized by kind of a feelings of being lost in the moment, that kind of lack of self-awareness. <laughs> and uh, you kind of lose your sense of time, and you, sometimes athletes talk about it being in the zone. But the really, I think the way it binds with all this together is that it's about arousal, it's about physiological, physical arousal, but it's about control as well. It's that, it's that getting the balance right. Doing flow, it's been demonstrated, kind of generates esteem, gives confidence, uh, it is enjoyment, uh, and it's also, it also has other effects like motivating. And it, dem and it generates self-efficacy, so it makes us believe more about control, it makes us feel we can control the world more. So in a way, by engaging the system, by engaging the world and learning, getting confidence by doing stuff and the feedback it gives, um, can actually have a very positive effect, not only on the particular pastime, uh, but in more generally in kind of perceptions of control. OK, we shall move on. So, um, a brief bit about optimism. Right, glass half full, half empty. Half full. Half empty. Mm, half full, in it? But then you weren't going to say half empty today, were you? So, if you ask people to judge the likelihood of events, so... Um, what, how likely is it over the next month you're going to exercise twice a week? Um, how likely is it over the next month you're going to begin a major relationship? Uh, or how likely is it you'll have to see a counsellor? Or how likely is it you're going to miss because of sickness? Healthy individuals are generally um, overly optimistic about the future. They show optimistic bias. Whereas um, people suffering from depression have argued, have been argued, to show what's called depressive realism. And that is that Depressed people have a better perspective of reality. They're more realistic, but they're miserable. <laughs> whereas, whereas optimistic people have, see the world through roast into spectacles and clearly think the world isn't going to be quite as, as they anticipated it, but they're happy. So I guess if you take one thing home with you tonight, it's live in a world of delusion. <laughs> no, perhaps don't, perhaps don't do that. But um, so... Optimism seems to kind of be in, in the population. It probably has some adaptive um, purpose. Um, and, it, and if you think about it intuitively, well, you know, it kind of you face challenges that you might not have done otherwise. Uh, it gives you a, ch a willingness to have a go. Um, you might not try if you weren't um, optimistic. You can just give up if you're pessimistic. So there seems to be this kind of... It, you can almost make an argument that optimism is, is good. Um, I think you can. Positive coping strategies, face of negative events, facing challenge, blah, blah, blah. Now, we might assume that optimism is, uh, again, it's kind of dispositional. We're just born with it. 
But in fact, one of the real advances in, in positive psychology is demonstrating that it's not the case. We can actually learn to be optimistic. It's about those biases. It's about those motivational biases that we acquire through life. And we can retrain them. So for example, optimists do this. If something good happens, so you know, I get promoted or I get a good job evaluation, then I say to myself, well, I did it. It's internal. I always do well at this. It's stable. And I'm good at this in general. It's global. Some optimists internalize good events. They say it's their fault. <laughs> Whereas negative events, well, it was out of my control. It's not my fault. It was a one-off. It won't happen again. And uh, I'll blame something else. Particular factor to blame. So in a way, optimists dissociate themselves from negative things, and they, and they internalize and, and acquire positive events. So there's, a sort of, there's almost like an interpretational and attitudinal difference. You, you know, to see the world in different ways, you interpret the world in different ways. Um, pessimists do the opposite. So basically, if something bad happens, then I'm sorry, if something good happens, they say, well, you know, it, it, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I was just lucky. Uh, it was a one-off. You know, I won't be lucky again. And you know, something, you know, something else did it. It wasn't me. Whereas if something bad happens, they say, yeah, yeah, it was my fault. I always do badly at this. I'm bad at this in general. So you might be able to see some of those characteristics in yourself, either the pessimist or the optimist. But they seem to be kind of basically attitudes, the way that we interpret situations. And of course, they can be changed. Um, and so there's a technique which has been, I guess, in a way pioneered by CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which, um, and is used primarily in therapy, but has been used by positive psychologists too, where you take these events and you, for example, get the pessimists to switch their styles. So you actually try and retrain them to see the world in the different ways. And it works. And so certainly within the clinic, certainly within in counseling and psychotherapy, um, there's quite a good prognosis. It's quite a significant impact. It's as good as, say, uh, pharmacology. It's good as drugs in treating things like depression, anxiety. Of course, it can also be employed in a healthy population. Um, and so in a sense, one of the ways that optimists deal with the world is that they, if they can control stuff and they can acquire the good stuff, they do. And if they can't, they kind of dissociate themselves from it. Right. So just to summarize, um, one of the, the most powerful, I think, demonstrations that uh, positive psychology has had is, is that, um, that you can learn to be optimistic or you can, you can change the style with which you see the world. Uh, and in fact, what you find is when you look at these kind of correlational studies, um, optimists do better in, in, in academia, they uh, do better in sports, uh, they do better in family life, and they show better coping strategies. They're more resilient to negative life events. So there is a positive, there is a positive benefit for being optimistic. OK. I just wanted to finish, and I guess I can do it pretty quickly, so if you give me five minutes. Um, you know, I've kind of, I've, as I say, I've skirted around the positive psychology world and given you some insight into the sorts of things people are doing, the kind of idea we have in neuroscience as to what's going on in the brain. Um, what I wanted to end with, really, was just a couple of experiments which demonstrate um, how you can go out and do it yourselves. So, you know, if you wanted to optimize yourself, uh, what could you go and do? And these are some recent studies that have been carried out in positive psychology. I mean, of course, um, the kind of the simple answer, based on what I've said, is that you know, if happiness is this sort of momentary pleasures and also engaging flow um, and ha life having meaning, then of course do stuff you enjoy, engage in flow activities, and have a find a meaning in life. I mean, it's you know, it's not rocket science. So there's simple things you can do. And, and you know, we can go through life without really thinking about this sort of stuff. But we, we can think about it. And so we can do these sort of things to optimize ourselves. But here are just a, um, three, I think, other things we can do. So number one, smile more. If you have a pencil or pen, stick it between your teeth like that. Do it now. Do it now. OK. Do you feel happier? <laughs> you perhaps look more silly. No. What about if you stick the pencil between your teeth like that? Do that now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure it won't work here. Um, what effect do these two things have? This one, you look a bit silly. I think you could agree. This one, you might also look a bit silly. But the important thing is 
that when you posture your mouth in a happy um, state, so if you bite a pencil, it makes you smile. It engages the musculature that you normally engage when you're smiling. If you do that, your, your brain is always assessing what your body's doing. So, you know, when you're hungry, your brain says, ooh, gurgling stomach, I'm hungry. When you're scared, your brain says, oh, my heart's beating, I must be scared. If you're smiling, your brain says, oh, I'm smiling, I must be happy. <laughs> and in fact, a few studies have shown that if you get people to have the pencil in their teeth like this, and then rate jokes, and compare it with a group that stick the pencil in their mouth like that and rate jokes, these guys rate the jokes as funnier than these guys. So it does work. It's a small effect, but it does work. So, smile more. Another thing you can do, which is, um, as you'll see, very potent, is what's called three good things. Now, as I mentioned, we live in the here and now. We live in the moment. But the way in which we retrieve memories impacts upon how we feel. So if we retrieve bad memories, we might feel bad. If we retrieve good memories, we'll feel good. So the way that this works is... At the end of each day, let me see. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Right. At the end of each day, what you do is you keep a diary for a week. Keep a diary, just for a week. That's all you have to do. It's not a, a, a big thing to ask. And what you have to do at the end of each day is write down three good things that have happened to you. You have to do it every day. And if you sit down at the end of the night and say, I can't think of three good things that happened to me. It's been miserable. You can't go to sleep until you've thought of three good things. You have to do it. And once you've written them down, you have to also put down a reason why they happened, a causal explanation. So the examples might be, you know, I tried out a new cafe and the food was really nice. So simple like that. It doesn't have to be life-changing. Or I was a bit bored at work, so I went for a quick walk. It was sunny outside. It was really nice with the sun on my face. Or you could be walking down the street and there's someone walking the other way and you just happen to smile and they smile back. And you just kind of, it just makes you feel a bit better. So simple things, little things... But do it every night for a week, three of them. That's all you have to do. So what happens when you do that? OK, so here's a control group in white bars, the people that are doing the three good things in black. And what you find, this is a rating of happiness, and this is a rating of how many depressive symptoms they show. So how positive are you, how kind of negative. And what you find, up to six months later, this is after doing it for just one week, the people that kept the diary are significantly happier than the people that didn't. And they have uh, far fewer depressive symptoms, so significantly less negative. That's an incredibly powerful effect. So we might say, well, why? How on earth can this work? And it's likely that, you know, as I mentioned, we live in the moment. So when we kind of just ruminate, when we just think about our lives, if we focus on the negative stuff, it'll put us in a bad mood. If we focus on the positive stuff, it'll put us in a good mood. And so what this does, it kind of trains you over a week. That through the day, you kind of go into yourself, oh, now, was that good? Can I put that down in my diary? Oh, let's have a think if I can think of another good thing that's happened. And so in a, in a sense, it's kind of retraining you to think about positive stuff. OK, and the final one, um, worrying. We all worry. It's natural. It's adaptive to a point. So people often try and suppress stuff that worries them, deny it, try not to think about it. But of course, it, that doesn't work. Uh, the example I got from the paper I read on this is blue sheep. There's a blue sheep. OK, think about blue sheep for a minute. Where's it gone? Here it comes. There it is. Think about the blue sheep. There it goes. Right, now, whatever you do, stop thinking about the blue sheep. Stop it. Stop thinking about it. Do not think about the blue sheep. What are you thinking about? <laughs> OK, so you can't do it. It's just against our, it's against our nature. But what you can do is you can postpone worrying. So you can say to yourself, I know there's an event or an issue which is of significance to me and I have to deal with it. But, you know, I'm in the middle of giving a presentation. I can't be worrying now. So you put it aside. You say, OK, so tomorrow night I'm going to get myself in a good mood. I'm going to watch a funny YouTube video. Um, I'm going to have friends around to be sociable. And then we're going to face it. And we're going to be kind of, uh, I know, solution focused. But... I'm not going to deal with it now because I'm, I'm not in the right state of mind. And in fact, if you try and do this, it can work. So you, in a sense, your brain somehow um, knows that there's a worry there, but it doesn't keep coming back like the blue sheep. Don't think about it later. Whatever you do, just forget the blue sheep when you leave. 
And so you can, in a sense, postpone worrying rather than have it nag all the time. OK, right, so let's finish. Be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry, be happy. That's the message. Um, and I guess if there was anything else, you know, in, in, to summarize this, is that the tenet of happiness psychology, um, seek it, because you can find it. You can go and get it yourselves. You don't have to wait for someone to bring it to you. There's something about control which is very important to positivity and a belief in control. Um, and if you can't control situations, you know, in that kind of truly optimistic style, blame it on somebody else. <laughs> Dissociate yourself from it. So in, in, the, in that sense, attitude is key. And also that, that kind of focusing on positives. Um, enjoy your mood and help others enjoy theirs. So I think one really powerful demonstration is things like with this oxytocin is that we're social animals. We evolve to be social. And even if you kind of, you know, you're a bit of a, I, I like to sit in my office and be miserable on my own for a while. Um, but, you know, go out and socialize because, in fact, it's very powerful. You know, you release your oxytocin and get rid of your bad moods. Um, and that's it, really. I will end with a little cartoon, which is one of my favorites, and just to say thank you very much for your time. John, thank you very much. I feel much happier already. Um, uh, one of the things you've, you've carefully avoided largely not talking about is sex. So I'm going to ask you a question about sex, if that's OK. okay. Um, so one of the things we often teach the students is that adrenaline and the sympathetic system, not only is it involved in fright and f fight, but it's also involved in one of the other Fs, um, <laughs> which is, of course, fornication. Those, uh, um, and yet, uh, you're, you're telling us a story about oxytocin, and, which antagonizes the HPA, the, the, that axis. So do you want to just fill in the gaps there for us? Yeah, I mean, I think there are probably a number of explanations. I mean, one that comes to mind is that, I th that oxytocin seems to be released to orgasm, particularly. And so I guess if we, if we go, through, if we go this, along the timeline of sex, then there's kind of arousal and excitement um, interpreted as being in control. And so I can, you can imagine that there's that sort of, there may be that HPA arousal stuff going on during intercourse, um, but, but at orgasm and beyond, there's more that kind of, oh, trusty, fall asleep together, lovey-dovey stuff. Um, and that's kind of, that's the nurturing um, affiliative stuff that comes afterwards. So I guess, you know, the, both systems kick in. Um, you mentioned a few causal relationships earlier, but you didn't um, talk about, like, Oh, sorry, yeah, correlations, but uh, what's the causal relationship between them? Like, if you're getting loads of good grades, then you would be more happy anyway? I think the, the key there, it's a very good question, um, and I think the key there is the way that they're interpreted. So you could have two individuals who both get the same good grades, and in the slides I showed with the optimism, one of them might say, yeah, I, that's because I worked hard, um, and because I'm, you know, I'm doing really well in this course and I'm doing all the reading. And so they would then lay down a positive memory that it was due to their hard work and therefore they're good and they can go on and be good and that would be optimistic. But the other individual could say something like, oh, well, I was lucky, the right question came up um, and I still didn't do enough revision um, and, you know, I won't, be, I won't have the same luck next time. And, and so they'll lay down a much more negative interpretation. And so in future, they'll, you know, if they then retrieve that, think about the expectations for the future, they'll see it very negatively. So it's, I guess the important point is not so much the event, but it's the way you interpret it. And, that, and that's what can be changed. That's what you can change. Uh, hi. Um, uh, I'd just like to ask your opinion on the element of... Um, positive thinking and whether how learnable and changeable that is, because some people have tried to argue that it's more a thing that you're born with. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Michael Isenck. He wrote a book called Happiness, Facts and Myths, and in it he presents the same argument that look, happy, um, you're, you're more happy if, you, if uh, you have that sort of s a system of attribution that you've just talked about, but he um, attributes it to personality, particularly um, neuroticism, that neurotic people uh, have the have a system of perception where they, as, as you just said, attribute good things to external causes and bad things to their own inadequacy. Um, and although mm, behavioral genetics shows that neurotism is inheritable to an extent, he, he kind of called, Michael Eisenk in the book calls the people, neurotic people, 
uh, especially neurotic introverts, the people with the unhappiness gene, gene and uh, stable extroverts, people with the um, happiness gene, so, um, without wanting to make him sound too uh, dogmatic. But what's your opinion on that? Well, I guess, it com again, it comes back to, um, you know, there's, we, do, we do come into the world with predispositions. And I'm sure that, you know, you could imagine it at a chemical level that maybe we've got more receptors for, you know, the neurotic individuals got more receptors for a particular chemical or, you know, or the, uh, the greater release of the chemical at the synapse. And I think the, the better way of looking at it, or I think something that addresses the issue of it more directly, is that certainly evidence from psychotherapy shows that if you take people that have a very negative um, attributional style, through retraining, you can turn, you can produce a much more positive attributional style. So the, in a sense, the proof is in the behavioral pudding that it can be done. You can, you can change people. And I guess that's at the, the kind of psychological behavioral level, so you can do it. I guess in the brain, well, you know, the brain changes, and we create new neurons, and we create new synaptic, you know, connections. And so everything that happens psychologically has a, you know, something going on in the brain too. So, you, okay, so we might be born with this predisposition to have a certain chemical response, but it can be changed. And I think that's one of the really important kind of messages in a way that it is labile. You mean make everyone happy? The whole thing? Well, it's a, that's a really interesting question because, and I vacillate on this, so on the one hand I kind of think, what a fantastic panacea that, you know, everyone could be enthusiastic and happy. And then I can think, oh my God, that would be terrifying. <laughs> and just imagine if we were all, you know, chirpy and enthusiastic, it'd be so annoying. Um, <laughs> And I, and I do wonder whether there's, a pla there's an evolutionary place in the world for miserable people, put it, shall we say. Um, but it kind of, it's, the, it's the balance, isn't it? That, you know, if we were all overly optimistic, we'd, do, we'd all die out because we keep doing stuff that you know, didn't work. Um, so I'm not sure, to be honest. What do you think? You think you're politicians? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think they're probably in a win-lose state most of the time, rather than a win-win state. Hi, John. Um, just wondering if you'd uh, agree or disagree with me with uh, the current an idea of mine. Um, in the current financial situation, obviously, people are having a very uh, difficult time getting loans and things like that. So on the suggestions of the, uh, of the findings and evidence that we've got so far, if I want to get a bank loan from my bank manager, I should give him some chocolates. So it's a surprise. <laughs> it's uh, a chemical link with oxytocin release that will make him more positive and then more altruistic about giving me a loan. Would you agree with that? You could take one of those oxytocin nasal sprays. <laughs> Might be a bit um, less covert. I mean, I guess I'd step one, one step further back and say, you know, money isn't the solution to your illness, so you shouldn't be getting a loan in the first place. <laughs> Just very, very briefly, um, just with relation to what you were saying about the amygdala and control, um, like emotional hijacking is when your amygdala unconsciously takes over your cognition, so you respond without even knowing it before it hits your brain. And I was just wondering, um, is there any link between if you're happier, do you have less emotional hijacking, or is, do you know, have you more control simply by being happier? I mean, that's a very good question, and I guess it's sort of, it, yeah, so it relates to that. Um, I mean, we know, so for, you know, just to paraphrase, um, so the amygdala does show a response to emotional stimuli, even if we're not consciously aware of it. So it, it kind of kicks in without any conscious control. And most of the evidence of that is in negative states, so it's fear. It's the kind of fight-or-flight response. And when we see something threatening, we react to it before we think about it. And then, yeah, and I guess the question is, if we're in a positive state, does it somehow suppress that reaction? And certainly, I don't think there's evidence for that sort of unconscious response to positive stimuli. I think it's much more uh, conscious and reflective. Um, so it's an interesting hypothesis, which I suspect is, you know, may well be true. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, the way I see it, it's all about um, th this don't worry, be happy, in my experience, is all about increasing communication skills, self-confidence and self-esteem. Um, and becoming more self-assertive. Um, so, uh, so would you agree with that? So there's one domain of positive psychology which I really haven't touched on tonight, which is that of emotional intelligence. And the idea of emotional intelligence really captures what you've just said. It's that 
being aware of your own needs, being aware of other people's needs, and the way that, therefore, social interaction can, you can work together for, the, for, a, for a positive end. Um, so I would agree. And I think one of, you know, as I described, oxytocin's major effects seem to be on that kind of affiliative win-win, you know, work together rather than against other people. Um, and so I think that sort of attitude certainly um, supports positive psychology positive, and engenders positivity. Absolutely, I agree. Because that to me is far less complicated, um, you know, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. Rather, I understand all the cognitive and everything else, but to some other people it can be very, very complicated. Yeah, you know, sure. If they don't actually study psychology... From a layman's terms, it's, it's you know, it, it is difficult to grasp. Mm. So um, yeah, I suppose I mean, I've said that for the benefit of people who, you know, are finding it difficult. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because that is my experience. It, it's much, I suppose I'm trying to simplify it. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, we evolved as social animals, and we, we live in social groups. Yeah. And, the be the, you know, if you can get on with our neighbours, then, yeah. then, then people are happier. Yeah. But, it's been, but basically it's down to oneself. Um, it's down to it's down to oneself to increase your confidence and um, work towards yeah. um, making yourself a happier person because yeah. no one else is going to help you to do that. I think so, that's a very important point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's not other people's fault. It's not about blaming other people. It's about um, being aware of you, your, you yourself, what oneself actually, you know, how we interact and think and. Um, that, that kind of thing. Absolutely. And change yeah. when we need to. And that's kind of that con the side of the control. It's in a way, it's yeah. taking control of the situation and being responsible for it yourself. Well, it's, it's about self-control. Yeah. Really, yeah. Because we can't control other people or situations. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier on that um, having positive mood may actually boost up our creativity, like we may have more ideas. But then, like for me and some other people, like maybe when we're in a, when we are more emotional, we may be more creative, as in writing and like drawing and making songs. So, how can you explain this? I mean, there is that kind of the paradox of the, the sort of the genius in a way that you know when we look at. Um, it might be kind of biased history, but when we look at the, the people that produce the fantastic paintings and the fantastic inventions, it's generally through deprivation and torment and pain. Um, is that a, a reasonable generalisation? Um, and I think that it's one of the great, it's one of the great challenges that, uh, that, in a way, what this is suggesting is that, yeah, we should all be chilled out and enjoy it and, you know, it'll, it will solve the world's problems. And yet some of the greatest breakthroughs are made in exactly that sort of situation. Um, and to be honest, I don't. I mean, I don't have the answer, and I'm not sure that uh, that, that psychology does currently either. Um, to be honest, no, it's one of those great mysteries which, hopefully, we will crack. Thank you. Um, the title of your lecture, "Don't Worry, Be Happy," obviously addresses a public of the north. But what about people? I know people in uh, South African townships who live in misery and who are happy. Does the same mechanism applied to them? I mean, it's an interesting, that kind of cross-cultural debate is interesting and also cross-situational sort of situational debate. And I think often it's about, it's that it comes back to that attitude or the perception of your situation and, and your aspirations. So I think it's, it's not so much about the absolute situation you're in. It's the sort of the relative, the way that you interpret it. So, you know, if you find yourself in a very... Um, a poverty stricken situation, but there are things you can achieve, things that still produce those momentary pleasures or have meaning for you, then I think, I think it's still very much applicable. So I think it's more about who are you, in what context are you in, what can you do to either enjoy yourself in the moment or give your life meaning, which I think provides that, that power. Not so much, you know, I haven't got any money or, you know, I, I, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. And in a way, those in themselves become, you know, if you think about um, in our evolutionary past, when we're on the savannah, then the things that probably gave us our momentary pleasures and the, and the, the purpose and the meaning in our lives was going out hunting prey and, and finding shelter for the night. Um, very basic things, which I think still can produce a lot of pleasure now. If you'll allow me another. Um, 
How dependent do you think happiness is on social interaction and having social relations? Certainly in evolutionary terms, I think it's very important. Um, and so the, what we do know about some of the neuroscience, it seems to be very driven to being pro-social and affiliative. So in that sense, um, I think when you look across our evolution, that there are things we can do on our, on our own that gives us great pleasure. But I think the real driving force, the real, I guess that kind of meaning in life, I suppose, in a way, is probably driven by the more pro-social, both interactive and also the kind of nurturing affiliative relationships. Absolutely. So I think it's, it's key. Yeah. Hello. Um, uh, just a brief question. Um, can you link happiness uh, to self-development? And if so, because I think, you know, often self-development is based on self-criticism and happiness. Maybe you read the book uh, Brave New World by Huxley. Often leads to a very dull state in which we, well, don't develop as such, and, you know, in evolutionary terms as well, maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And again, it's, it's about, I think, if happiness is a sort of a, a, a con constant, serene state, perhaps isn't that motivating or driving. Um, but I think the sort of different types of happiness I described, so the kind of the engaging in things, where you face challenges, but you learn to control them, or you learn to overcome them, then I think, so I mean, and I showed that, the, 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 the video of the sailing, um, you know, I've had some very negative experiences sailing, uh, which uh, I had to overcome in a variety of means. Uh, but they, because I have overcome them or faced those challenges and, and learned to control them, that I feel a, a you know, greater self-esteem, greater self-confidence now. So I think it's not so much that we're looking to be kind of flat and serene here. I think it's looking at the ways in which we can go out and seek experiences that we enjoy or challenges that would make us grow. So I think happiness, or at least positive psychology, is very much about self-development. Um, and the stuff around flow activities and engaging is, is really driven at um, you know, doing stuff that will challenge you, but you'll be able to master it. And it gives self-confidence, self-esteem. Absolutely. Yep. Um, based on the um, article you present us you know, in the very beginning of this presentation, my question is, could the weather can have an, imp an impact on happiness? Because um, I don't want to mean by, you know, I'm coming from a country that is very sunny, yeah? And you know, people there, they always laugh. But you know, I'm noticing here and, you know, <laughs> no offense to British people, yeah? <laughs> Whale. <laughs> but I'm noticing that, you know. <laughs> Did you say the weather? Sorry? You said the weather? Yeah, the weather. The there, was, there, was a recent, there was a recent article in the paper, uh, it's probably about a month ago now, and it was about, it was a, a theory of why the Scottish are so miserable. <laughs> and it argued very strongly that you can correlate happiness with cloud cover. Or oh, an inverse relationship of happiness with cloud cover. I mean, so, and it, obviously it was tongue in cheek. But, I mean, it must have some impact, you know. But you could argue it could work both ways, because if you live in a country where it's always sunny, then every time you go out, you go, oh, it's sunny again. Whereas here, you know, the sun's out, and it's like, way! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it could work both ways. <laughs> just on that um, comment, just then on the weather. Are you Scottish, by the way? No, no, <laughs> I'm not very good at accent either. Um, with the air pressure... Um, people get headaches with the air pressure, low air pressure. And so would that, do you think that could have anything to do with the mood? Wow, that's left field. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Um, I guess so. I mean, if it produces physical effects, you know, if it produces symptoms, then of course it's going to impact on your mood. Um, like anything that has such effects. Uh, and I guess if you live in an area which has a particular pressure ratio, you know, Whatever. Um, then yeah, it might have an impact. Yeah, I'm, I'm flailing here. I'll give up now. I've no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, we should leave it there. Thank you very much for your time.